So today I want to join you. It's my honor and privilege to welcome you to the second K. Woltman visiting lectureship. Um, the K. Woltman lectureship, and today's title is Ethical Policy and Challenges in Palliative Care of the Frail Elderly. So the K. Woltman Endowed Visiting Lectureship in Health Communications through the IU School of Nursing is an annual lectureship that will allow trainees, clinicians, and community providers, faculty, and students um, direct access to nationally recognized experts uh, focusing specifically on the critical, critical issues of communication uh, across the lifespan. Mrs. Woltman, who was a phil philanthropist and volunteer leader uh, in several healthcare, uh, educational, and community service institutions and organizations, um, she served as she served on five boards in uh, in and around the city of San Diego, California, and while still holding uh, an active role in the Woltman family business. Um, Kay did not see a world without uh, a glass ceiling. She saw one she believed in hard work and preparation that enabled her to be um, competitive. Mrs. Woltman was a director, executive vice president, and chief operating officer. She was a superb businesswoman and was guided by high values, great dignity, grace, and humility. She died on August, uh, August 27, 2010, um, after fighting lung cancer. The lectureship was made possible through a remarkably generous gift from the Woltman family uh, to the Indiana University School of Nursing. Mr. Rich Richard Woltman is an IU graduate from the Kelly School of Business, and uh, his family wanted to do so something positive in memory of Kay, um, something that would help others uh, change an experience that they had. So the Woltman family described Kay's care uh, in her uh, cancer treatment as wonderfully compassionate but it was um, obvious to them that the team caring for them, caring for Kay, was not prepared to help them with their questions. So the lectureship is part of a three-part initiative to develop and implement best, practices mo best practice models for enhanced communication among uh, patients, families, and providers who find themselves in, the end, in end of life situations. I have the honor and privilege of serving as a project director for one of the components of the gift to the School of Nursing. We are grateful to the Woltman family, particularly as in their response to a less than optimal experience was to make it possible for others to have a better experience. So today, I would like to also acknowledge the many partners in the Woltman uh, lectureship. That would be um, the Fairbank Center for Medical Ethics and the Respect Center at the IU School of Nursing. And now, today, I get to introduce you to our guest speaker. Um, she has been very busy over the past two days meeting both with faculty, students, and community leaders. Um, oh, somebody didn't hear the intro. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Easily distractible. So Joanne Lynn holds a Master of Arts degree in Philosophy and Social Policy and a Master of Science degree in Quantitative Clinical Science. She is a director of the Alterum Institute Center for Elder Care and Advanced Illness, which uh, is a center that aims to ensure that frail elders can live meaningfully and comfortably um, in susta with, at sustainable costs. The work includes implementing and measuring care plans, developing methods for counties and cities to monitor and manage the elder care, um, coaching and uh, counties and cities, and developing support for caregivers. She's been working with county governments and agencies on the practical side um, and with Dobson, um, Dobson Dawson, in creating financial models to support comprehensive frail elder care in geographic communities. Dr. Lynn has been a tenured professor at Dartmouth and George Washington University, a staff member at uh, CMS, uh, the bureau chief uh, for Center and excuse me for Cancer and Chronic Disease for Washington D.C., a researcher at the Rand Corporation, and on IHI's quality improvement faculty. She has been quite busy. Um, she is a member of the Institute of Medicine and a master of the American College of Physicians, a fellow of the Hastings Institute, and an author of more than 280. Uh, peer-reviewed publications. So I would like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Lynn, and I will tell you she is passionate and quite well-spoken. So um, get ready for a wonderful presentation. So I've had great fun in the last couple of days getting to know uh, many of you and hearing much more about what's happening here. It's a very impressive endeavor. You've got uh, more geriatricians here than we have in all of Washington, D.C., uh, by about threefold or fourfold. Um, so, and doing really interesting things. Uh, but I want to invite you on a bit of a journey together and um, you know, encourage you to you know, put up your hand and, uh, and take issue or whatever you need to um, with whatever I uh, am saying. Um, but first, you know, let's, let's get a little you know, audience uh, survey. You know, it's always about data, so you know, 
Um, how many people here hope to grow old? <laughs> I think everybody's hand got up on that one. How many? Hmm? <laughs> how about um, how many um, expect to die? <laughs> Always gets the chuckle, like if you put up your hand too quick, maybe you'll be the one hit. Um, going to give you some choices about how it happens. How many people would prefer to be hit by a truck? No one? A oh, one, okay. <laughs> how many, all things considered, would take a big time cancer? No one? <laughs> how about uh, heart and lung disease? Heart failure, COPD? Not a single one. You're the only outlier. <laughs> So everybody else is with me and hoping for frailty and dementia. <laughs> Hardest thing for Americans to understand is there's no easy way out. <laughs> and you know, basically, if you die young, I'm a geriatrician, so you're like under 85 or so, um, you'll have a single disease mostly, um, and you'll mostly have a reasonably predictable course. And then for the rest of us, all of you chose to join me in hoping for this, you will get a long dwindling course. This is the big change in American medicine. Um, so I, I've always loved this cartoon. I actually went and got permission to use it. Uh, one of the rare times when you don't violate copyright. You know, the surf asked the wizard, do you have anything to stop the aging process? And the answer is, sure, which disease would you like? And <laughs> that's basically what you were just doing, was picking your disease. And um, your disease is multifactorial frailty in advanced old age. We now face, on average, for people who make it to age 70, 2.7 years of self-care disability, requiring someone else's help every day. That's the average. 10% of people get more than five years. How many people here are prepared for even the 2.7 years? Quarter million dollars, or good insurance. Two, how many have three or more daughters or daughters-in-law who live within 20 miles? That's the other way to be insured. <laughs> yeah. So three or four of us are well prepared, and the rest of us are with the rest of the country in being disastrously poorly prepared, in part because no one thought they were going to have this period of time just 50 years ago. 50 years ago, the average age of death was still under 70. The usual causes of death were abrupt. So people might know they had a little bit of a weak heart, but then they had a devastating heart attack and died. All in one sentence, all in one day, usually in one ER visit. Uh, same thing with strokes, same thing with many infections. You know, people died rather abruptly, I mean, within a week or two of having gotten sick. What were the big exceptions in historical past? Big exceptions where people were disabled for a long, long time. Think about 100 years ago, what were big disablers? Tuberculosis and mental illness. And what did we do with them? We sent them off somewhere else. Yeah, we put them in big institutions. Um, so the ordinary flow of the community did not have large numbers of people who were disabled at any age, and certainly not large numbers of elderly people, because they just weren't large numbers of elderly people. And we, when there were elderly people, we didn't think they were appropriate targets for medical care, you know, or certainly not surgery or chemotherapy. I mean, you wouldn't take an 85-year-old and put him through surgery just 40 years ago. And now, of course, they're spring chickens. We put them through surgery all the time. So what you're hoping for <coughs> is a meaningful old age in relationship with others and comfortable. And what you mostly get is you know, a whole lot of medical stuff and a whole lot of disability. And um, this is, you know, I mean, there, there are nicer ways to paint this, of course, and there are lots of people trying hard to do so. But... Um, it's really the case that there is a new phase of life for most of us, which is the phase of life of serious decline, disability, in advanced old age. And very few people escape it. So you know, it is now a majority way to come to the end. So this is the way we built most policy and most imagery in the United States. Here's the onset of something bad. You know, she got a diagnosis of whatever, lung cancer, kidney cancer, something awful. And mostly did pretty well for a while, I mean, except when she had surgery or she had chemotherapy or something. But May you know, was still paying rent, uh, you know, living in an apartment, uh, driving a car, you know, doing all the usual grandmotherly things, and then had a period of time called terminal illness. 
and the phrase, he's dying now or she's dying now, with a real decline in the quality of life, functional ability, usually over a very short period of time. So hospice was built on this image. Hospice was built on the image that you would know who was um, dying now, and you could wing in with all the right services, you know, home care, chaplains, um, home health aides, drugs, uh, everything you needed, because you're only going to have to be there for a very short time. So essentially, the patient promised to die within two federal holidays. Everybody can gather twice. And then it's only decent to be leaving at that point. You know, you don't stand at the door and kind of hang up the party. You know, so you know, people were expected to go on and die once they were dying. Damn it. And we were going to build policy on this. We are still doing this. 26 states this year have a legislative proposal uh, to allow physician aid in dying or physician-assisted suicide, depending on which side of the argument you stand on. And they all turn on terminal illness. That's this image. That there's a period of terminal illness. Unfortunately for policy, most of us now get what you all chose, the long dwindling course, where one thing is wrong and another thing is wrong and you don't quite have the reserve here and there and the teeth are going and the hearing is not so good and, you know, and, and, and. And you end up with self-care disability for an average of just under three years. This is the usual course. This is the person whose family turns to you and says, mother can't go on much longer like this. And you say, oh, oh yes, she could. <laughs> you know, that habit of breathing in, breathing out just kind of keeps going. You know? and, um, or she could have been gone last week. You know, She aspirated a little last week, coughed a whole lot, could have been a fatal pneumonia. You know, she's living on a tightrope. She's in a very fragile state. Why this week, not next week or last week? Who knows? Dying itself becomes quite unpredictable for any individual. You can draw good curves for 100 people or 1,000 people, but for any one individual figuring out whether this person is going to eat the fatal pretzel you know, and die this week or stay on their diet and make it for much longer. I had one patient once who went two full years after having an echo uh, read out by the cardiologist as a 3% ejection fraction. She had no palpable blood pressure when she stood up and she sort of moved around her apartment like this, I assume, to get a little bit of blood to the brain, and spent all of her time watching television, had no grandchildren, so she never got exposed to viruses, and um, hung on for two years. And then one day she kind of felt a little queasy, went to bed an hour early and was dead. Why then? Why not two years earlier? Why not a year later? Who knows? Um, that's the way most of us will now live out the end of life. So it's a very different phase of life than we've had in historical times. We don't have stories about this. We don't have movies. We don't have newscasts. Uh, what do we know about Ronald Reagan once he rode off into the sunset? Nothing. Nothing at all. I used to have elderly ladies in my nursing home who would say, um, I don't want to die like that girl in New Jersey. <laughs> but it wasn't, there wasn't a chance that they were going to die like Karen Ann Quinlan. But who else could they call on? We don't have any shared stories. We don't have a single movie you can point to in popular culture about this phase of life. We're edging toward it with still Alice. But, you know, that was a very unusual situation. She was still in her 50s. So, you know, I'm, I'm waiting to see the movie where... You know, the 88-year-old is allowed to really develop a, a character and still be cracking jokes about sex and is in a wheelchair and can't see and has dental problems and is driving her family crazy. You know, then we'll know we've grown up in this country. Population is due to enormously increase and already has. We have fewer children today than we had in the 1950s. But look how many more we have of the elderly. Between 2000 and 2030, we will nearly double the number of frail elders. Between 2030 and 2040, we will nearly double them again. You know, we, all those you know, kids that we were so fond of in the 1950s, you know, building schools and delighted with all those little kids, you know, they're all going to be 85 <laughs> and 90 and 95 all together. And what have we done to prepare? Have you heard a politician talking about really making sense of advanced care, of, um, of long-term care? Have you ever heard a politician you know, taking a lead in this? No, third rail of politics. But this is just demographic fact. You know, we, it's not as if we can evade it. We know how many people are likely to be old and frail in, 1930, in 2035. 
And what are we doing to prepare for it? The average worker at retirement today has $72,000 in savings, mostly tied up in their house, and barely enough pension to live on between pension and Social Security. The average worker, that means half or worse than that. The average cost of long-term care is on the order of a quarter million dollars. Where is that gap going to fall? The economics of it are really threatening. Here's this, this is the macroeconomic spending of the entire population over the uh, age range in 1960. This little tiny line here at the top is public spending on health care, and the yellow line is private spending on health care. Look what happened with Medicare. Look at the public and private spending on health care. And then just before the crash, look how much it had increased already. Now take this population, the one at the end of the scale, and multiply it by three. That's where we'll be in 2035. We will swamp the economy if we don't learn to take care of people at a lower per capita cost. Or, see that one line up there? That's the average productivity of the average worker. The other way to make it work is to increase the productivity of the average worker. We are really doing well at that, right? 50% of the kids, more than 50% of the kids born in the country this year will be born into Medicaid. We are not doing well at encouraging the productivity of our worker force when we have most of our kids being raised in poverty. So this is a very daunting set of slides and images. We will actually ruin the economy if we try to spend what we now spend on a per capita basis for the large number of frail elders. There are ways around that, but they require starting now to have the savings that creates a capital um, investment opportunity to develop um, ways of taking care of one another that are much less expensive. So there's an absolute drive to do that. How are we going to keep from going off the cliff? We propose a... Um, a system that um, I'll talk about in a minute called Medicaring. But since this is an ethics issue, I wanted to raise some of the ethics issues pretty explicitly. First is, I'm proposing that we see another, a new category, like pediatrics. There was a huge fight in around 1900 in medicine as to whether little children were just smaller pieces, smaller images of adults, or whether there was really a specialty of pediatrics. You know, we now have come to assume there's a specialty of pediatrics, and we take care of children differently. But is there now to be a category of frail elderly that we actually take care of differently? I think so. Didn't matter 50 years ago. We didn't have enough, <laughs> and we weren't doing much for that population. Now, most of us will, in fact, have this piece of life, and it will be very different. I want you to know that my priority right now would be to return to my health this morning if I were to suddenly collapse. And the most obnoxious person here who knows how to do CPR very well, welcome to do it, and you can run up any bill you want. I've got a really high priority to returning to health if I would, if I would collapse right now. Not true if I were here at 92, living with six illnesses, 17 medications, eight doctors, you know, kind of keeping myself on the tightrope. Now I have all kinds of preferences and priorities. I may be very concerned about leaving a legacy for my grandchildren. I might be very concerned to finish the great American novel. I may just want to see the flowers bloom. But I have all kinds of different priorities and preferences, and most of them are not about having every possible chance of uh, living a little longer. So it becomes much more complicated. So is there a category of frail elders that we really should design around? For most of us, this period of your life will use more than half of your total lifetime expenses on health care. And much of that will be in long-term care. So of course we should do it right. We built a health care system around the hopes and fears of 50-year-old men in suits. We built a health care system in which you can get 911 services anywhere, anytime. You can get hotshot rescue services. We put all kinds of money into ICUs and ERs. But heaven forbid that your caregiver should break her arm on a Saturday. We don't have any backup caregivers. We don't even provide respite. We, got, we don't even barely notice the caregivers. So you know, we did not build a care system around the hopes and fears of 88-year-old ladies in second-floor walk-ups. Who is who we will mostly be serving? 
Instead, we built a care system that was attuned to a very different population. So I claim that we need to create this category and begin to really design around it. And not the setting, not the disease. You know, we shouldn't have a system for heart failure. We should have a system for people who are living with substantial disabilities in old age. There's a confluence right now of a whole bunch of really bad stuff, as if we cleverly designed it to make it difficult. We had the demographics that I've already talked about and the economics, but then we also have cleverly arranged it so that the children of the boomers do not have retirement security for themselves. So whereas in the 50s, people who retired got defined benefit packages that really made it quite possible to live well, the children of the boomers have defined contribution policies, many of which were rated in the 2008 recession. And the um, retirement security for the children is completely inadequate now. And they will have to keep working. Plus, we cleverly had very few children. So if you go back a generation or two in your own families, you'll find seven, eight, ten people in your know, siblings in the family. Now that is really rare. It's more zero, one, and two. So we don't have very many children. And we also are needing the help when we're older. So the children themselves are now old enough to have arthritis, have bad backs, have problems themselves. So if they can work, they need to keep working. And if they can't work, it's because they're disabled. Who is going to be taking care of the old people? We assume it's a family matter. But the family structure is so very different. And then we also um, change the trajectory. So it creates a real risk of, um, of really abandoning elderly people. When I started working in nursing homes in 1978, there were whole states where the average nursing home patient was either sedated or tied down every day. There were whole counties and multiple nursing homes where the average pressure ulcer rate was over 50%. So we have come a long way since that kind of abandonment. But those weren't evil people doing that. Those were people who didn't know better and had very inadequate funding. All we have to do is ratchet down the funding and learn not to look, you know, not to inspect, not to report, not to talk about. We could be right back there. So are we going to, in fact, face real abandonment in our old age? You know, four or five of us have uh, adequate savings to at least accommodate the 5% risk. All the rest of you, good luck. <laughs> so um, you know, I think we really have to figure out what it means to live a good life in the shadow of death in an advanced old age. I think it's kind of easy to say for people who are still mentally alert, well, it's whatever they think is important. You know, we defer it to the person themselves and say, you know, if what they really want to do is spend their time saying the rosary, you know, that's OK. If what they really want to do is to bet on the horses, as long as they don't lose all their money, you know, they could do that. Whatever it is, that will be OK. But what do we do about the half of us who will have serious dementia? What do we do about the half of us who will have um, serious cognitive failure as part of our course? We haven't even had a public discussion about that. And if you go to court, it will be dealt with as if you had a mere disability. So you'll get a court-ordered dialysis. You'll get a court-ordered you know, treatment as if you didn't have this disability. That's crazy. We would never have developed these things around dementia patients if they were the only ones affected. But that's what you'll get now. So we really need to have a conversation. And then one of the big things is, what is it the families owe? You know, almost all states have some kind of a statute requiring filial responsibility, where the state can come after the kids to pay for the parents' uh, expenses. Those have never been enforced. So they're effectively not there. But what kind of responsibility should the children have? It used to be that the major transfer of wealth was from one generation to the next that the usual person got something of a legacy when mom and dad died. Now mom and dad will have spent all of their assets and more. Will we start tapping the next generation to start paying those bills? And then what happens to the next generation? And what do you do about profoundly dysfunctional families? 10% you know, of families have serious abuse within the family. Are you really going to go to a kid who was beaten as a child and say you've got to pay for your parents' you know, nursing home care? Um, you know, we, don't, we are the only country that I've ever you know, investigated. There must be somebody else out there, but we're the only developed country that has no family caregiver policies. 
as a nation. So almost every other country, there's payment into the social security system if you're taking care of a family member, or you're paid for taking care of them. You get a respite of you know, three or four weeks a year in which somebody else will come in and fill in for you so you can you know, go to a wedding or get a surgery yourself. Um, there are all kinds of arrangements to support family caregiving. We've made it as hard as possible. Nevertheless, most of the caregiving given to the elders is done for free by family. And we've built the whole system around the invisible caregiver. We don't even require that the caregiver be identified in electronic records. Meaningful use does not require even having a slot in the electronic record to record the caregiver. Do any of your records here, I mean, not counting children, but um, for adults, have a slot for the family caregiver? Anybody? You know, think about that. I mean, we're relying on the family caregiver, and we don't even name them. We don't often don't let them in the exam room. You know, we don't. We certainly don't pay them anything. And then, of course, there's the ongoing issue of, you know, what about the person who says, "I'd rather be dead than live through what I'm facing," and um, stops eating and drinking, or insists upon taking an overdose? You know, we have barely begun to even think about that in the context of serious chronic illness. We think it has to do with lung cancer. We think it has to do with kidney cancer. Now it has to do with a person who comes to the geriatrician and says, you know, if I keep living like this, I'm going to use up all the family's funds. We're going to lose the business. We're going to lose the ranch. We're going to, you know, my, my wife won't have anything to live on. I want, to, I want you to see to it that I don't live very long. Are we really going to go along with that? Because the community hasn't provided the supports we need? You know, think about that. We have not been willing to even raise these questions. We talk about end-of-life issues as if it's about decisions about CPR. It's about decisions about spoon feeding. It's about decisions about housing. It's not really mostly about CPR. And yeah, you need to decide CPR, sure. But really, it's about all these other issues. So we have a proposal that brings the, all the pieces together. Um, I think it's fairly appealing, but it requires reform at a pretty basic level. So we're trying to assure that Americans can live comfortably and meaningfully at a sustainable cost through the period of frailty that affects most of us in our last years of life. So that's the goal. And uh, this is the basics of the model. So the first thing is you have to see frailty as a different piece of life that deserves a different kind of care system than you had when you were 50 or 20. Second is there have to be longitudinal person-driven care plans. People have very different priorities. Uh, you know, I've had my two elderly gentlemen who wanted to be sure they were schnockered so that they didn't call out to Mabel while Maud was at the bedside. Think about that a minute. <laughs> um, you know, people have very different priorities. I've had people who wanted to be out of doors. I've had people who wanted to be sure they didn't lose the ranch. I've, you know, all kinds of priorities start crowding on stage. And we have to really help people figure out what are the most important things that reasonably could be achieved and then put together a care plan that goes after achieving them. How many times have I heard of somebody being sent home from the hospital only to sit on the curb because nobody realized that there were three steps up into the house and nobody realized the person could no longer take the steps? Um, so we have to get the care plans that work and then they have to be available across time and setting and evaluated. Even the settings that do good care plans, I've never seen any setting yet that actually evaluates how well they're doing. A uh, third thing is the medical care that fits, you know, much, uh, more wary on the use of drugs, much less burden of medical care so that people can't do anything else other than run around to their various medical care providers. Uh, all the principles of medical care, including moving services to the home when it has become too difficult for the person to come to the doctor. So you know, people, because of disability, because of family situation, because they're in a second floor walk up, whatever, end up really having a period of time when the doctor needs to come to them. And so does the nurse, and so does the respiratory therapist. I mean, we need to be able to move the medical care to the home when it becomes too hard to take care of the person in, you know, in, in the doctor's office. We, in every community in the country, we have a group of people who are getting all their medical care through the ER because that's the only way they can get transport to the doctor. Th the fourth thing is that uh, we have to have social and supportive services present as full equals. Not as afterthoughts, not as, you know, sometimes we think about this, but if your community doesn't have housing for frail elders, then
that has you know, wheelchair access and, and shower bars and those sorts of things, you can't send people home. You end up having to send them to a nursing home. If you don't have uh, Meals on Wheels accessible, you know, there are places within easy shot of here, namely, namely Detroit, that runs a six to 12 month wait for Meals on Wheels. What are you gonna do in six months waiting for food to be delivered? You know, if you didn't have kids who are willing to bring it in, you're in a nursing home. So what you can do in a community turns heavily on the social and supportive services. Then elders are quite tied to where they live. If you don't have housing that is um, disabled responsive, you're stuck. If you don't have Meals on Wheels, you're stuck. You know, it isn't as if you can go to the neighboring town for a second opinion on spoon feeding. You know, it's got to happen where you live three or four times a day. So the community becomes terribly central, both because the person is tied to that community and because that's the natural way to organize these sorts of services. So we need some way for the community to come together and give voice to the priorities, preferably evidence-based, so that we actually develop some evidence as to what those sh severe shortcomings are in our care system. And the shortcomings can be oversupply. We have way too many hospital beds, way too many cardiologists, way too many something, and that we really need to pare back because we're essentially inducing the demand. If you have a whole lot of empty beds and a whole lot of people looking to fill them, there are going to be people in those beds who didn't really need to be there. So there needs to be some way to get a community voice on the priorities. We call it a community board. Could be chartered by the city, could be chartered by the county, could be chartered by the state, I suppose. But somehow there has to be a way to get the community's priorities into the equation. Every other country has something like this that works. So we don't. We don't have any place where you can have the argument over whether the next dollar that you can get a hold of needs to go to food or needs to go to ambulance services or, or primary care doctors. You know, we need to have a place where you can at least have the argument and gather the data that's necessary to make the most prudent possible judgment. And then how are you going to fund any of this? Well, right now we have the extraordinary opportunity of pulling the waste and low value services out of Medicare and using that money in investing in our communities. It's a very fundamental uh, reform that would allow Medicare funding to go toward Meals on Wheels or to go toward housing, but to bring the Medicare waste into this uh, system. So how would you find the frail elders? Simple approach, and, and there are many variations on this, but this is just one simple approach. People have more than um, uh, one ADL deficit, requiring constant, super, constant attendance by somebody else. They have enough dementia to require constant supervision, or they have an illness that's going to get there within the next year or two because you don't want to tell somebody with ALS, no, you can't get this intelligent scheme just because you aren't yet that disabled. You know, people will want to get into it you know, earlier. And you would move people into this system unless they were uh, affirmatively opted out. So it would be the same sort of thing as obstetrics. You, know, you say to the pregnant woman, you really need to sign up with an obstetrician now, and here's a list of who you should go to, and almost everybody goes that way. You don't expect that people are going to say, no, I don't want any obstetrics. I want to, you know, I don't know, have, uh, have you deliver me, uh, you know, and, um, you know with, with inadequate uh, resources and a care system that was not set up for that uh, purpose. But you also could have just very elderly people who realize that they're up against it and their reserves are thin and they want a care system that makes sense and you'd allow them to opt in. And then you would have to have a care system that can deliver lots of services to the people who need it and very thin services to the person who doesn't yet need it but you're just sort of on standby for when things fall apart. You really need care planning. Care planning is the unicorn of modern medicine. Everybody can describe a care plan and no one has seen one. Um, so you know, doctors think it's a list of medications and see me in two weeks. Nurses think it's a set of, um, of nursing type problems. Social workers think it's concrete services. Nobody brings it all together and says, okay, so how's this person going to live? How's this person going to handle getting food in? How's this person going to handle their finances? You know, what, is the what is the best possible future that we can put together for this person given their resources, given their challenges, and given what the community offers? That's what we need to do. 
And we have to learn to be very honest about prognosis. Now, how often have we told families, oh, we'll just have to wait and see how much your mother recovers after this stroke, rather than telling them, you know, it's really unlikely that she'll ever recover better than a two-person transfer. You know, we don't tell people honestly what they face. So we need these sorts of things, and then we need to evaluate the care plans and know whether we're doing a good job or whether we're misleading people or offering them services that turn out not to be available. And then there's this very interesting thing that if you had all the care plans for a geographic area, so let's say you had all the care plans um, electronically for Indianapolis's uh, frail elders, think about the management tool you suddenly have. You suddenly could map all the places that need in-home services. You could know whether it was home health aides or nurses or doctors. You could know how many beds you need in your nursing homes. You could know, know how many doctors you needed to have doing uh, house calls. You would have the ability to manage a system because you have the care plans. And especially if the care plans included an annotation that said it would be better for this person if they had X, but X is unavailable. So we had to compromise and do Y, Z instead then you would really have a spur to trying to address the shortage of X, whatever that is. Um, the chronic care management code that CMS uh, just came out with has this list of what goes into a care plan. I think it's actually pretty good. Um, you know, it isn't required, this isn't what they're going to enforce, but it's a very interesting list, and I think it's probably pretty well thought out as to what, um, what should go into a good care plan. We do need to geriatricize medical care. The very first requirement is continuity. This idea that every doctor is substitutable, every nurse is substitutable, every social worker is substitutable leads to abject chaos in the lives of frail elderly people. You know, the most important thing is continuity. I once was writing an angry note to a whole bunch of uh, people leading a major hospital in the East, um, and my lead line was, I give up on competence, just get me continuity. My aunt has had no doctor who has stayed with her for more than 48 hours, and she has been in your hospital for most of the last six weeks on five different admissions, and nobody knows her at all. So I give up on competence, just get me somebody who'll stay with her. You know, continuity matters a lot. You can't do the right thing without knowing the person. You have to have reliability. You have to be 24-7 right to the end of life. You can't be just the 9-to-5 uh, provider who you know, vanishes on the weekend. Things happen. There has to be a way that the care plan is really available. You have to enable self-management. People are not under our thumb most of the time. They're taking care of themselves or they're taking care of their family member. You have to really enable self-management. Put people in real clothes. Have, talk to them as real people. You know, we teach passivity in our hospitals and uh, doctor's offices. We um, need to respect and include family and caregivers. Um, it is lunatic that we have most of our Medicare system now serving frail elders and we do not record the caregiver or the caregivers. We don't know whether they got trained. We don't know whether they can handle what they're being uh, handed. And so you know, the family caregivers expected to change the foley, something that isn't usually allowed for anybody beyond, you know, with less training than a registered nurse. And they're learning on somebody they care about. So you know, this is a really bizarre arrangement. We need to attend to the burden of medical care. Medical care has become just overwhelming for lots of people. Moving services to the home. Then there's a set of things that are just sort of geriatric syndromes. You know, the giving the person the wrong set of drugs, uh, failing to inquire about falling, not doing a home inspection that would turn up that the person has a whole bunch of throw rugs, you know, or doesn't have any lighting in the hallway. My mother would not give up her throw rugs until she was kind of tripping over them. And um, I said, okay, so you have 21 of them. I'll let you keep three. <laughs> All the rest are going, and they're going tonight. <laughs> you know, but you, know, you have to be in the home to see that. You have to enhance relationships and meaningfulness. It isn't a matter of simply staying alive. It's a matter of whether the person feels like they're really human and they're really engaged with things. You have to make it possible for people to get out of the house and go to their club, go to their church, um, be involved in things. You have to make it possible for people to stay engaged through social media. Uh, whatever it is that keeps the person um, you know, really being engaged in the life of their community. In lots of the uh, European countries now, young people can live for free in senior housing simply to be the connector and the person who goes and checks on everybody every day. You know, what a nifty idea. Um, we, and I think I can't do better at the moment than saying 
that we have to just live out the time with people who are living with dementia. That we don't really know what to do about dementia. Where the person still has some of their characteristics, they're still so kind of Aunt Rose, but they also really can't remember from one day to the next. We don't really know what a good course is with that. You know, sure, avoid pressure ulcers, sure, avoid fractures, but beyond those sorts of things, what counts as a really good life for somebody with dementia? There are many demonstrations of success. We have had all kinds of small studies showing one thing or another that saves money and improves care. And the really sad thing is that in all of these, they are not sustainable in our present system. That every other country has a way to incorporate these um, innovations into the mainstream of their medical care. And we don't. We study them to death, so to speak, but then we don't actually change how things are paid for so that the good ideas can blossom. Um, we also have this remarkable uh, tendency to celebrate how much we spend on medical care. Notice how we're way out of line with every other developed country on the percent of our gross national product we spend on medical care, we spend almost twice as much as the next competitor. But if you add the social services, we're just in the middle of the mix. We don't on total spend more, we just spend more on medical care and thereby have a remarkable disproportion. So most countries spend twice as much on social services as they do on medical care and we spend the same amount on medical care and social services, which means that our social services are funded as a safety net. Programs come and go. No one notices that they come and go. 25 million meals were taken out of Meals on Wheels in the sequester. And where were the marches in the street? If you had taken out uh, anything like that in heart uh, um, procedures, there would have been massive protests. But we can take food out of the mouth of, old, of older people and no one even notices. We aren't even measuring it. On the medical services side, it's an open book. I can write with a sweep of my pen um, for a $100,000 drug and it'll actually get delivered. But I can't get a caregiver on a weekend. I can't get Meals on Wheels for somebody where there's a queue in the, in the community. And unlike any other country, we have no integrator that's actually pulling these things together. So we keep them on entirely separate tracks, entirely separate funding, entirely separate research, entirely separate uh, um, uh, professional advancement. And then we somehow expect it to magically come together. But what we get instead is inappropriate services, unreliable services, unmanaged systems, and wasteful care. That's both our calamity and our opportunity. So consider the ethics issues. What about planning? Is failing to plan a culpable error? I think so. I think we should do things like the, the second or third time a person comes back to the same hospital with the same set of serious chronic illnesses in old age, and no one has talked with them about their preferences. The hospital shouldn't get paid. They blew it the first couple times. You know, I think it would take about, what's today, Wednesday, it'd take about till Friday before we learn to do this. It's not hard to do. We just haven't prioritized it. And so we failure to plan. I mean, I was working with one hospital where they had a very high proportion of COPD patients. There had been a mining community, lots and lots of smoking, and you know, one way or another, people had really ruined their lungs. They had a cadre of about 50 people who came back and forth with COPD. They had no way to know their pulmonary function tests because those were done by an outside lab. And they had zero rate of advanced care planning in the record. So you didn't know when the person came back the next time if at this point they were worn out and did not want to go back on a ventilator. You can't actually take care of good end of life care with a COPD patient without knowing whether they want to be on a ventilator. So I think it's a culpable error. Why don't we penalize it? Because the system is run by those who are guardians of the past and not really looking into the future. We know how to make these things happen. We just haven't cared to do it yet. So why don't we insist on plans or evaluate them? Because we don't even have them. We don't even think they're important. You know, a person gets discharged from a hospital and no one even knows whether their home is, is still in existence. I mean, whether they whether the rent not being paid for the past uh, month has meant that everything's been put on the curb. You know, we, don't, we aren't involved in the lives of our patients in a way that we actually know that the plans are important. So why would, what, what would one need in order to manage the care system? Well, I think first off, we need to really be much more creative about what counts as quality. 
all of our quality measures now are set up by professional standards. So if you have a heart attack, you're supposed to be on these three drugs. What about if you have a heart attack? By damn, somebody better talk to you about your future within the next month. And if nobody talks to you about your future within the next month, the whole system ought to be fired. You know, let's get serious about this. Let's ask people what their preferences are and get them written down, and then have them give us a score. We could start there. There are probably better ways to do it. But let's figure out whether we're actually pursuing the patient's goals. The person who desperately does not want to spend themselves into poverty is in a very different spot than the person who doesn't care. The person who very much wants to be adherent to a particular religious creed is in a very different spot than the person who has no particular spiritual issues. We need to know whether our care plans are actually serving the people we're trying to serve. Unless you think that this is all a pipe dream, this is the um, a small piece of the publicly available website in Sweden that tracks the well-being of frail elders by municipality. So there's three counties in Sweden, all on Chipping, which is at the bottom end of one of those long lakes. And they have this many, many municipalities, and this is their tracking of the municipalities in cross-section on a whole bunch of frail elder um, uh, components. Uh, one of them here is, um, psycho, is psychotropics. Um, well, I'll show you another one here. Oh, no. Um, you can also do this over time. They now record the care plan and all the elements of the care plan and whether they got implemented. So you can know whether if you're in, you know, if you're in um, this town rather than this town, what proportion of your care plan elements are not being implemented on a geographic basis. We can't do anything on frail elders on a geographic basis. We can't even count noses on a geographic basis. But we could. Other people are. We could do this. We just have to care enough to bother to do it. So we need some community organizing. And these are some of the things that come up. We have to expect that it's going to be difficult, that community organizing is not going to be easy. It's going to take some new levels of governance. It's going to take some new ways of cooperation. Um, you really need to involve the patients and families, because otherwise you'll get off track and, and adhere to professional standards. So elderly people need some uh, new spending. There needs to be some new money brought in. Where is that going to come from? Well, I think that it can readily come from Medicare. This is my mother. This was when she was 90. She picked up a small suitcase, couldn't have weighed more than 20 pounds. She immediately said, oh my god, I've broken a vertebra. She actually knew it was D12. You can tell what year she went to medical school. It was dorsal 12 instead of thoracic 12. She went on to have every imaging study known to man. She had six imaging studies over the next two weeks. The only thing she needed was the flat film that would prove that she had the correct diagnosis. Her orthopedist urgently wanted her to have um, you know, vertebuloplasty, where you reinflate the vertebra. The only, th the only procedure I know of that has had two sham randomized controlled trials showing that its major impact is to increase the rate of fracturing the vertebra above and below, and that at six months, the outcomes are all the same. What did she actually need? She needed to be referred from the ER to home care, have a good home care nurse, make sure her pain was managed, that she was getting food in, that she was staying clean and mobilized, and getting back on her feet as quickly as possible. That's the banal waste in, me in Medicare. It isn't that we're sending people off to heart transplants. It's that we are routinely overdoing everything we do rather than thinking what did the person actually need and what's the efficient way to provide it. In almost every other country that I've been to, the ER doc could send her home and send a home health nurse in the next day. She didn't even have to ever see her primary care doctor or an orthopedist. In our system, the ER doc has no idea who the home care uh, would be and no interest in knowing that and just says you'll have to talk to your primary care doctor tomorrow. And maybe the person gets in to see the primary care doctor, but probably gets sent to an orthopedist. And by the time anything really happens, you know, things are just in chaos. This was a story in the New York Times. This is my sad story number two. This is Mr. Andre, who in his 90s was living in a rent-controlled apartment in New York City for the previous 60 years. Very much wanted to get home. He had all these things happen to him pressure ulcers, nursing homes, uh, multiple nursing homes, different nursing homes, different hospitals, different ERs. He actually got home once for 48 hours, and the home care agency said, we can no longer take care of you because every day is a loss leader for us, and we thought you would die as soon as you got home. 
So you have to go back to the ER, where Connie went to another nursing home. Mr. Andre ended up spending uh, four nursing homes, many ERs and hospitalizations. His cost in the last year of life was $1 million to Medicare and Medicaid. It was over $1 million. And the only thing he wanted was to go home. We could not have spent that much money getting him home if we had put in round-the-clock home health aides. But that was not available. All this other stuff was available. And everybody who provided it got paid. And it didn't violate any quality metric that we've got out there now. And yet we massively disserved him and spent a million dollars doing it. That's the kind of lunacy that we need to go after. So we went and found four communities that were willing to work with us and estimated their actual savings in medical care. And these are some of the assumptions and the methods as to how we went about doing it. And we did very realistic measures of how quickly they could implement various kinds of programs. These were programs like GRACE or guided care, um, you know, the, the optimistic that you all are developing. These are, you know, how, but how fast could you get people enrolled? How quickly could you get them um, uh, really up to snuff? And um, we assumed it would take two years to full impact. We adjusted for all these things. And here's what turns out. So this is without the program. Here's how much was spent per person per month. This is with the program. This is how much changed. And look at how much you're saving per person per month in the program. Which means that every community had substantial savings within three years. Milwaukee here, incidentally, is a suburb of Portland, Oregon, which we picked because it's a very, very skinny system. And we were not sure whether in a system that already is pretty efficient, could you still find enough savings to make this make to work? Obviously, in a place like Queens, you could save as much as you might want. They're at the top of the Dartmouth Atlas list on expenditures. <laughs> So the return on investment was positive in every community by the second year. Why can't you do this? Because you have to have Medicare involved. You have to have Medicare allowing it to happen. Medicare has to jump in and give waivers, either on a managed care front or on an ACO front, that allows the savings to come back to the community. Otherwise, the savings go to the managed care owners, to the shareholders, or in the ACO to the hospitals and doctors that set it up. We need a way to get some of the savings to come back into the community to provide the social supports that people need. So that's the main pitch. And um, the bottom line for the four communities was that within three years, they saved $22 million. Um, and then from there on, it would be basically the year three amount per year. So $20 million per year saved. That would be enough to make a big inroad on the waiting list for Meals on Wheels. You know, the social services side is were nearly actually fairly inexpensive. Mm -hmm. So how could local management arise? Well, it turns out there are all kinds of structures in most communities. Already, the Area Agency on Aging, the Public Health Office, and every, every uh, nonprofit hospital has to do an assessment of, of needs in their community. What if they actually went together, worked together on it, and started figuring out the priorities and building the coalition that in an ongoing way could keep establishing priorities? Some places have a coalition that's already working. Some places have a managed care company that's willing to take the lead. I'll bet every community in the country can find some way to move toward a medicare approach. And there are some serious ethics issues. You know, since there is a way to provide really good care at an affordable price everywhere in the country, is it a serious ethics problem that we aren't doing it? That we are allowing the current dysfunctions to persist? Then I'll bet you have people in your hospital today or in your nursing home who have no care plan. I'll bet you have people who are getting inappropriate medications. I'll bet you have people who are getting inappropriate imaging studies. And this is one of the leadership places in the country. You've got lots of good geriatrics happening. But we just haven't changed the core of what it is we think matters. You know, who's paying attention in the room for whether there's a waiting list for Meals on Wheels? Who's paying attention for the housing? You're in a very different position if your community has for years been insisting upon universal design and insisting that every new housing project includes some affordable housing for the elderly. If instead you have the usual carte blanche and realtors can do, I mean, um, developers can do whatever they want, then you will have lots and lots of people who have no option but to go to a nursing home or an assisted living, in which case they spend down to Medicaid and become impoverished. You know, it makes a difference what the community has rallied to do. 
So, um, you know, how about the ethics or ethical mandate and the political mandate? You know, our politicians are unwilling to even talk about these issues. In Washington right now, the only comprehensive approach that's on the table for frail elders is ours. That's crazy. There ought to be 10 or 15 competing proposals. Nobody will even talk about it. The, Accountable, uh, the Affordable Care Act um, had the Class Act in it, which was supposed to provide financing for long-term care. It was actuarially unsound and was eventually eliminated. That was the only thing that actually addressed this population, other than a couple of small demo programs. We are not willing to even confront our own old age, and yet you all chose to be frail. With one exception, everybody else chose to be frail. You're building your own future. If we don't start pushing politicians and making it possible for them to talk about these issues, because we don't even talk about them in our movies. We don't talk about them in our newspaper articles. We don't talk about what it is that a family goes through as they you know, help parents go through serious disability and dementia and old age. So when the numbers increase beyond the capacity of our inadequate savings, are we actually going to learn to walk away? Are we going to learn to allow people to go back to being tied down? Are we going to go back to uh, sedating folks? Are we going to go back to um, you know, thoroughly inadequate um, care system? Or are we going to bankrupt the country by continuing to spend as we do now? We have to find the middle path that allows us to take good, reliable care of people at a much lower per capita cost. So why is it that my mother could get all those imaging studies but couldn't get a home health nurse? There's something really lunatic about that. There's something really lunatic about allowing hundreds and thousands of Mr. Andres to go through the system running up huge bills, which pay us all, allow us to you know, build our fancy buildings and allow us to you know, create um, careers for people and massively disserve him and drive us into bankruptcy. We really need to learn to speak up. So what are the first steps? What do you want to do first? I'll throw it back to you. I'm going to quit here. I have some more slides, but I'm going to stop here and give you a chance to weigh in. Could you do something creative in Indianapolis? Could you do something creative in some community in Indiana? Could you go to CMS, pushing them for the waivers that you'd need in order to make it a viable um, option? Or are we all going to allow it to drift and get exactly what we deserve? a really miserable care system that bankrupts the country. Yes? Terrific. Good. So the, that's the kind of thing that we need to be doing. But now we have to also make it sustainable. So somehow the, the, the money you save by doing good care planning, because mostly people will choose less medical stuff than we're now throwing at them, is a very good thing for the trust fund, but doesn't help you actually build the options that you need to build for your community. So we need a way where some of the savings comes back to the community that's doing the right stuff. We can't just be sending money back to Washington. It has to also, a little of it at least, come back to you so you can do these creative things. Others? Questions? Comments? Anybody ready to um, start counting failure to plan as a medical error? Let's start making it reportable. Just like taking off the wrong leg in surgery. A person came into this hospital three times with COPD or CHF or cancer or just dementia and frailty, and nobody made a plan. Nobody even asked them for a plan. Yes? How do you go about um, There are some programs that allow families to be paid as a caregiver in the United States now. The Money Follows the Person uh, programs that most states have uh, signed up for allows the family member to be paid if the patient chooses that person as their caregiver. It's a pretty much minimum wage and so on, but it's at least a start. In most countries, um, the, family care, the family caregiver, if their income is under a certain amount, is simply paid, I mean, as opposed to paying an outside party. Um, so I mean, it's, it's just part of what the structure is. Um, you know, in many countries, it, it, um, you know, the, the patient has the choice, the, the, the elderly person has the choice of who they're going to have, and, and the economics are almost flat. 
So it's, it's just a very different way of organizing the care. And those countries don't have cardiologists making $400,000. You know, their doctors are making twice what their school teachers are making. You know, we're so used to thinking that you know, it's perfectly legit for you know, us to have uh, professionals at these very, very high wages. Well, you know, if you're a doctor in France, you're making about twice what the school teacher's making. Not four or five or 10 times. You know? um, so yeah, it's a very different way of organizing what it is we're about doing. And it, and it changes the power relationships. It means that the home care nurse is a very central element, whereas, you know, and, and is made a hero in the, you know, soap operas and so forth, not just the ER doc. You know, and it isn't mainly about rescue. It's mainly about how are you going to live with very bad stuff. Yeah. So, I, actually, wait. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, because I know we have people who have to leave. Um, Dr. Lynn is more than welcome to stay. I want to ask people to please. I did say she was passionate. I, I do want to say that I warned you. So thank you very much for your talk. And for people who have continued questions, please stay after and chat with her. But please join me in thanking Dr. Lynn for a wonderful presentation. Thank you.